so Institute for Quality of Life, and um, there are some very interesting words that are piled together there, but what does that mean? What is the Sodexo Institute of Quality of Life? Elaine, good morning. Thank you for your introduction. Great to be here. Very good morning to you all. So the Sodexo Institute for Quality of Life. Well, um, the Institute is Sodexo's in-house think tank. Um, it's based in Paris, and it's part of the group's transversal functions. And its aim really is to look outside the organization, most of the time towards academia, towards like-minded institutes, to universities all over the world. So in the last three or so years, we've worked with universities in South America, North America, Western Europe, also in India and Singapore. And what we do is, by looking outside of Sodexo, we try to help Sodexo understand better what are the drivers of quality of life, how they relate to the progress of individuals, and the performance of organizations. And why do we do that? Well, we do that because under the umbrella of quality of life services, Sodexo does three things. It serves people right across the full spectrum of facilities management services, so anything from food services to cleaning to reception services across all sectors. So in the corporate world, in hospitals, universities, offshore oil platforms, on mines, in the military, everywhere we serve people. Um, we also, perhaps close to Collins Hearts, we also have a very big global um, benefits and rewards activity. And a lot of that is about helping organizations to motivate, reward their people, keep them engaged. The third thing we do is um, we provide personal and home solutions. So imagine you're coming out of hospital, you need a bit of help at home. A Sodexo person might help you with cooking or a bit of shopping or cleaning or you know, if you're an older person, uh, we might help you around the house with things like getting up, getting dressed, doing the necessary things. And we believe that all of those things, they're not just services. Yeah, we deliver services, but the overarching purpose is to improve quality of life because we believe that contributes to the progress of individuals and the performance of organizations. So as a think tank, we're really lucky. We're spoiled. <laughs> we get to think about all of these things, you know, from, from cradle to grave, and everything in between. So it's a lot of fun. And some of those things that you think, think about, so some of the research that's come out of recently enough, one of the topics that's very um, commonly talked about in the world of work, the idea of us working alongside artificial intelligence right. and intelligent robotics. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about some of that? Sure, perhaps I'll, I'll just um, you know, start off with, with the perspective. I think when we're talking about the future of work, it's important to understand the perspective. And um, as an institute, my, my perspective is this, look, Sodexo is a huge people organization um, across the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. I've got about 3,700 colleagues. Expand that to 80 countries worldwide, and I'm one of 425,000 people in about 80 countries. So a huge employer. So workplace, fundamental to us. But also, we serve about 75 million people worldwide Tens of millions of the people we serve are at work. They're school teachers, they're in universities, they're in hospitals, um, they're in, in seniors' homes, they're in the military, offshore oil platform, some mining sites. And most of our service is face to face. So we need to understand the workplace from an internal perspective and from a client perspective. And over the last three years, um, I guess I've really been inspired by three things that I've seen that have really made me think about it hard. First thing, 2013, in the autumn, paper produced by an um, engineer and economist at the University of Oxford. They put together a brand new model for thinking about work and automation, and they estimated that based on 702 detailed occupations in the US, about 47% of US employment was capable of being automated. That's the first time I've really been you know, made to sit up right in my chair about the figure 47%. It's neither 99, it's neither 0.1. Slap bang in the middle, 47% of, of employment. That's huge. A couple of years later, um, inspired by phenomenal speech, speech by Andy Haldane, chief economist at the Bank of England, a speech actually to the Trades Union Congress, really important stakeholder in the future of work. And um, he gave a huge sweep of labor economics over the last 250 years. And he said, okay, so we probably need to think about three things, really. You'll like the first one. We need to think about relaxing a bit more. <laughs> you know, we might end up with a little bit more spare time, a bit more leisure time. And that was kind of an echo of where John Maynard Keynes, the Cambridge economist, was in the 1930s. 
But he also said, again, fundamentally important, I guess for all of us here, we've got to think about retraining and skills. Third thing he said we really need to think about is redistribution. How do we rebalance income between all of us? And then the last thing that really inspired me was um, a report that came out only in January this year. It was produced by the McKinsey Global Institute, McKinsey's think tank. I really like that approach because, you know, the 47% was macro level, and then, you know, you've got Andy Haldane going in a bit more detail. But McKinsey said, look, in all of this, actually, we can think about jobs, we can think about roles, but let's think about tasks and activities within jobs. And that really got me going. Um, so just a couple of months ago in Singapore, um, I convened a round table with experts from universities there in robotics, in uh, human robotics interaction, and our key research question was this. From the perspective of individuals at work, thinking about different tasks, what does the advent of robotics in the workplace mean for quality of life? And we looked at tasks from the perspective of the physical environment. How does AI robotics help to make my workplace more comfortable, less dangerous? How does it in some way improve my health well-being? How does it in some way improve my social interaction? So we've gone from looking at the macro picture and thinking, Ooh, 47%, about $14 trillion worth of activity could be automated, but it hasn't yet, through to starting to think about the, you know, the relax, the retrain, um, and then really starting to think, actually, hang on, let's be smart about this. Let's look at it on a task-by-task -task basis. And that's pretty much where we've got to at the moment. And Colin and Adrian, I mean, you're in organizations uh, overseeing a lot of technologists who are probably at this point working on technology that might replace them one day in their work, which I'm sure is a psychological barrier to get over. And the statistics uh, you've quoted, and I have some here as well, PwC has said that in the UK, within 15 years, up to 30% of the jobs in that workforce will be replaced or will be defunct and replaced by AI. But I would argue, well, 30% of those jobs, we might have 30% of new jobs created in 15 years because there's jobs now, I mean, you've been with Facebook for seven years. I'm sure there's jobs available now in Facebook that didn't exist when you started seven years ago. Yeah, I, I'm, apart from my own job, I'm not sure we have any jobs that existed seven years ago that still <laughs> exist. Because um, people still want to be paid. But um, yeah, I, I think it's, the reality is, I, I would totally agree with you, how many jobs exist today that didn't exist 20 years ago? And, and that, I think it's evolution rather than, you know, we're going to have a whole load of people wandering streets with nothing to do. Um, I, and I think jobs will change and people will change with those jobs. And hopefully, I guess, you know, in, in the context of artificial intelligence, it will take away those tasks that we all have to do but hate doing. Um, and then people can spend more time doing work that they actually enjoy doing. Um, and maybe engaging the right, the right side of their brain a little bit more. Uh, you know, one of the ones that jumps out at me is that I was talking to a, a someone who's just joined Facebook and joined from Apple. And they said at Apple, I had a phone and I had email. I pretty much knew that was how people communicated with me. Whereas I said to him at Facebook, one of the challenges we have is you have a phone, which very rarely rings, but you've got email, you've got Facebook Messenger, you've got Workplace Messenger, which is an internal version, um, you've got WhatsApp, so you've, um, then you've got Facebook groups where you get pings. So you have six or seven daily sources where you can be contacted from or where you need to engage. And I don't think the human brain is capable of managing that kind of workload at the pace that we work at. So how can we use artificial intelligence to curate all those data and bring to the top the stuff that is most important to you? Because we all know when we open, if you work in a company that's headquartered on the West Coast, you wake up every morning and you have to read through 50 emails to find the four emails that are relevant to you. And it's how can we take artificial intelligence and apply it to those types of challenges internally so that, you know, ultimately people then can do, do the work that they really want to do rather than trying to filter through and find the work that they're supposed to be doing. And that sounds fantastic. And then I remember your talk, Adrian, which actually kind of terrified me a little bit because it sounds wonderful to be able to automate the menial tasks and to free ourselves up for more creative thinking. I'm a manager. A lot of my job is doing those menial tasks, tasks for other people and making sure things are run correctly. Should I be scared? Um, like if I'm not creative, am I going to struggle to be part of this workforce of the future? Oh, on, on the contrary, I think, uh, I think managers definitely have a role to play and leaders. And I think 
a lot of, so I'm a manager as well, and I spend a huge amount of time on management admin. So that 61% of busy, busy work, there's probably a lot of that that I would love to see robotics and chatbots or I don't know, technologies that I'm not yet aware of come and help me with some of that in order that I can do what I don't think is going to be possible through robotics or, or any of uh, the technologies, which is really coach people and spend the time. And many of you are either in one-to-ones with your manager or as managers hosting one-to-ones, and you spend your time going through transactional, okay, this needs to be done by Friday, where are we on this part? And you, you don't have time to sit back and go, okay, so this customer is having an issue. How are we going to? It's like do, 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 do get through all of the transactional stuff. So I don't. I think there's a really strong role for for managers specifically. And I think the point about retraining and the point about jobs that will exist in 10 years. Uh, Anne referred to the fact that my daughter is in the audience. I don't know what she should be when she grows up because I don't know what jobs are going to be there. Um, and I mean that quite seriously from an uh, from an excitement perspective. Um, I've worked in Google, I'm working in Dropbox. There are, I have a whole team of people whose roles and, and job descriptions didn't exist a decade ago. And so I think this is an evolution rather than a crisis. And I think retraining is important. And I think uh, humans will, uh, and ideally, be freed up to work with humans and bring that element uh, in combination with leveraging technology efficiently. And that actually rings with something that I spotted in your talk, Colin, when you talked about um, your technologists building things that have impact and they can work on what are probably typically referred to as fringe cases. And if, if you're doing one-to-ones, you can probably spend a bit more time dealing with those. Do you think that with more automation, it means that maybe people with different abilities will be better served, people that are beyond the majority will be better served by people who are freed up to deal with those cases? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I guess if you look at, you know, Connecto, we talked about, you know, there's two billion people that use Facebook. And a lot of those people are, you know, like you and me who don't have any, you know, issues in terms of accessing the technology. I think it's around how then can you make technology smarter so that all of society can benefit from it. I mean, one of the things that we, we, we're doing at the moment, which is, um, is trying to find parts of the world that are underserved by telecoms providers or where their people don't have access to the in internet and provide them with access to you know a kind of a slim down internet so that you know that they can get access to information around education around medicine or health um, and we're you know we have a company in the state of England that builds drones that are like uh, that fly kind of at 90,000 feet and beam down the internet um, and, you know, they're going through test flights at the moment. They have a wingspan equivalent to that of 737. So, you know, those, I guess that's how we as a company are trying to dream big in terms of, you know, what are the possibilities here to actually bring more people, be more inclusive? Because part of why the mission has changed is the recognition that actually, okay, economies and society has advanced, but actually a lot of people have been left behind. So how do you take the people that have been left behind and try and bring them on a journey as well? Because I guess a lot of the geopolitical climate at the moment is driven by the fact that people are feeling they're, they're being left behind and they want to make sure that their voice is heard too. That's great. So this is a nice idealistic future that we're all looking forward to, <laughs> yeah? yeah. Um, but there are also, there's a bad side, I'm sorry, there always is. Um, if we have increased automation, we have exoskeletons to help us lift things and to do power work, it sounds like what we're doing is going to be focusing more on mental labor than physical labor, increased sedentary lifestyle. Health implications, Thomas? <laughs> Look, I think that there are a number of different ways of, of looking at this, from, from the lifestyle, the quality of life perspective, from the quality of life at work perspective. I think this is really where the task-based approach becomes really interesting. Let's imagine that you're in, in the care sector. You work in a hospital or you work caring for older people. Today, relatively often, that involves moving people. People are heavy. People are fragile. When you move people around as a carer, you put yourself at risk of muscular skeletal injury. With advanced technologies with exoskeletons or other technologies that we haven't even dreamed of, we take that part of risk away. Similarly, think of other jobs, for example, you know, perhaps not in Dublin, but in many countries of the world, North America, for example, people get up onto roofs and remove snow. That's inherently dangerous. They fall off. 
people still go and inspect tanks that have held toxic substances. So let's stick the robots in. So there's a lot to be said, actually, for getting rid of some of the physical activity, which is dangerous and poses a risk. When it comes to the sedentary um, lifestyle issue, imagine that we do free up some of our time. We have more time for leisure, more time for getting outside. Imagine when Colin comes into the office, he doesn't have to wade through those 50 emails from the West Coast every morning that were sent PST at some early hour in the morning. He doesn't immediately have to sit down. He can spend more time standing up and having a chat with his colleagues rather than immediately getting down, sitting down, despite all his discipline, probably leaning forward a little bit too much, shoulders come up, and we go forward. So, the truth is, 50% of today's activities could be automated, but they haven't been automated yet. It's up to all of us to envision what it might look like, to plan for it, and in so doing, make our vision reality. We have the chance to do this. Well, it sounds nice to have lots of free leisure time. Um, I don't think we all are very good at spending our leisure time doing Ironman training, like Colin. <laughs> Some of us would just spend all that time on Twitter. Hi. Um, so, and I mean, you come from a workplace that you said you have so many lines of contact, you can be pinged constantly. Uh, how, do you try to encourage people to have like just the idea of switching off, have something else, have another activity, uh, maybe not Ironman training, but something a little more manageable? <laughs> well, yeah, I think as a manager, you know, in, in terms of the team that I am immediately, and I have a team um, across the globe, but I mean, my personal, I'm very open with people in terms of how I work and in terms of how I worked. And, and actually, um, there are weekends, I, I, I have two phones and one is a work phone. And on Friday evening when I get home, I leave the work phone in the bag. And I may take it out on a Sunday just to see if anything, you know, people can contact by Facebook if it's really an emergency. Um, so try and build that discipline. Um, you know, people work, I think if you've honest people on your teams and you trust them, they, they're working really hard. You, you know, I, you have to try and almost intervene, I think, a lot of times with people to force them to be more disciplined, to encourage them to either take time out during the day or as happens in Ireland, and I'm a sucker for this maybe because I like it as well, if it's, a, if it's a sunny afternoon and they don't have meetings with the West Coast, what are they doing in the office? Get out and enjoy the sunshine. If you need to get back online at half eight, nine o'clock at night when things have cooled down a little, do that. But try and, try and make work work for you. Um, and, and, you know, the, the approach I've always taken is a company will, will take whatever you're prepared to give it. So you have to be very disciplined in terms of how you set out your stall then, in terms of how you work. Um, and that's, you know, it doesn't work all of the time, and there will be times when you feel kind of things are a little bit out of control, but for the most part, I think, ultimately, it comes down to the individual being very disciplined about how, what they want to do and, and trying to have an honest dialogue then with the people they work about so that they manage expectations around that. And would it be the same with you, Adrian? I mean, I've heard you speak before about how the location of Dropbox being in Dublin and having uh, its other HQ in, in the States means that they can kind of do a 24-hour cycle with handovers from the States coming to Dublin. Does that then put pressure on workers to be working 24-7? Um, I, I think it does. And, uh, you know, I have the same thing when I get up in the morning and all the emails that have come in. And I have uh, people in Tokyo and Sydney, so there's something going on with them in the mornings and then the afternoons. I have a team in Austin, so I'm actually just a little bit ahead, so Austin wakes up before San Francisco. So it's kind of a steady thing all day. Um, and I think when, when I first uh, joined Dropbox, I remember the team that I had, they were quite frustrated and they were like, you know, we have to do all these evening meetings um, and, you know, our team meetings at 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. or whatever. And I said, okay. I said, have, have you asked to change that to, to working hours? And they were like, well, well, no, it's just there. And I was like, okay, well, we'll, let, we'll just ask. Um, so we said to San Francisco, guys, it's 7 p.m. in the evening. Could we change this to 5 p.m. or 4, 4, 4 p.m.? Yeah, sure, no problem. And so I've gone through a process with Teams, and I, I did this before at Google as well, is it's, it's okay to push back, and it's okay to start um, drawing boundaries. It's okay to put things in your calendar that say it's outside of working hours. And I, I try and educate, it's up to us, if, if you're based outside of a HQ, it doesn't matter where in the world it is, to start to help educate HQ around what the boundaries are. And, and it, you can do it in a very, very constructive way. Um, and so I rarely do evening meetings. I often log back on. I fessed up to that in my speech. And I clear emails or I, I do stuff in the evening. Um, but I rarely do meetings. So I'll do them 
now and again, but I don't have any standing meetings uh, uh, in the evening times, and I rarely work weekends. And I really encourage each of my team members to find that too. And if they're struggling with particular stakeholders, just you know, on a trip over or in a meeting, just bring it up and, and help educate people. Because, you know, people in San Francisco don't wake up first thing in the morning and go, I wonder what time it is in Dublin. I mean, they don't. So we've got to help them uh, with that. So it's a bit about employees kind of need to be confident enough to make work work for them to, I think to so. stand up and say, oh, I don't think that it's appropriate to do this meeting at this time. And Can as we leaders as well, watching that in the team and seeing who is struggling to set that boundary. Because I think, I think it takes time before you're very confident in yourself to set those boundaries. And so that, for example, is the type of coaching thing that you can do with in, in one-to-ones and with teams is really to start to, to help people kind of go, well, why are you here 16 hours a day? What What is your output? Well, maybe help people prioritize what's important because m most people want to be helpful and so they take everything on and then everything has to be done and, and just trying to help people go, it's okay to say no now and again. And is that awesome. something you see coming from the top down, Thomas? I mean, Sodexo has clients that are some of like the biggest yeah. companies that have been around for a long, long time. Dropbox and Facebook <coughs> are born on the internet. They're new and they can, they can behave like new companies. Yeah. But old companies set in their ways. If employees start to say, I want to make work, work for me, what are they going to say? <laughs> um, look, at, at, at Sodexo, we're 51 years old as an organization. Um, this year, I wouldn't say it's set in its ways. It's anything but. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, our current CEO, Michel Landel, is uh, retiring after 12 years at the helm very soon. And um, into his shoes is going to be stepping a new CEO called Denis Mechrel. Last year, I got the chance to work with him. And it was a round table that we convened. And the subject of our round table was agility and work in the 21st century workplace. And you know, agility, easy word to stay, and quite difficult to achieve, really. And it's kind of a combination of speed and stability at work. And you know, hearing Adrienne speak about uh, the challenges of time zones and different teams crossing over the, the different parts of the day really made me think of the things that we got out of our rounds table. So speed and stability for agility. At the core, teamwork, really strong teamwork. Face-to-face -face contact, and not just like this, which is great, which is we're sitting next to each other, but face-to-face -face contact, even using admittedly flat screens, really important. You know, if communication is 70% visual, it can't just be the phone, right? Um, widespread sharing of information, so decent handovers between individuals, between teams, and also, as you were saying, flatter, flatter hierarchies. Why? So that when it comes to the stuff that matters to quality of life, to quality of life at work, to speed plus agility, like just standing up and say, hey guys on the west coast of the US, would you mind starting this call at 9 o'clock in the morning your time, because that'll be 5 in the afternoon my time instead of 7? With slightly flatter hierarchy and a more agile organization, we can do that. So in this perfect future, where uh, everything's automated for us, we can be more creative, we're lifting things using exoskeletons, what are the kind of skills that we're going to need? Because we're at a point now where we're talking a lot about these particular innovations. Five years from now, there'll be new things that we're panicking about and pretending you're going to steal our jobs when really jobs are going to be created. If we need new skills, do we need to be reskilling constantly to keep up with the constant change of the workforce? And this is for all of you to contribute to. Yeah, yeah for sure. I, I think, but I, I think the reality is a lot of jobs come down to problem solving. Um, and so most of, if you think about your own job, if you think of, uh, people come to you with a problem that they want help solving. So, you know, in certain jobs, yeah, there's a technical and the functional skill set that you need to apply. But in a, most of the jobs that people do, it's got someone's got an issue and how do we help them solve it? Um, so I think that's not going to change. Um, I don't know if AI is going to take care of that for us. Maybe it will. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, in terms of the skills that people need, I think uh, a little bit like what Adrienne said about, you know, her daughter, I, I, my kids as well, I don't know what they need to think about today because I don't know what they need to be. Um, I think ideally what they would do was follow their passions and do stuff that they love doing, then hopefully then they can build a career out of it. Um, but beyond that, in terms of the types of skills, um, you know, I think the more interesting thing is that um, I listened to the radio this morning. Apparently, 65% of men over 20, over 25% of men over 65 years of age are still working. 
So you think of that future in the workforce where typically people retired at 60 or 65, that's not going to be the case in, in going forward. So the challenge, I think, for work environments may become that you will have everyone from 18 to 70 as part of the one company. And how do you create a culture, uh, a work environment that reflects that, um, embraces that, um, and allows people to have careers that will probably peak, peak and rise over a much extended period of time. And that actually is quite similar to something we were discussing backstage, Thomas, about intergener intergenerational uh, training. Do you want to talk a bit about that and explain that like yeah, we did sure. so beautifully backstage? Uh, you know, just, just two points I'd like to make. I'm, I'm aware of time. I think we're going to have to concentrate on two things. A, um, education, skills, training throughout the life course. The idea that we have education in the first 18, 20, or if we're really lucky, 25 years of our lives, forget it. It's going to have to be pretty formal at different posts throughout. Coming to your point, intergenerational learning. And this is not about the younger guys teaching the older guys about tech and the older guys teaching the younger guys about management. No, it's about mixing it up and accepting that different generations are about life trajectories, about skills, experience, and ex accepting that it's going to have to be very dynamic because no single person in the workplace, even today, has complete mastery of their subject matter area. So it's going to be a lot of fun and very dynamic, but we have to bear that thing in mind. Lifelong learning and intergenerational scaring, um, scaling and sharing in a really big way. Okay, and I'm just realizing that we did run out of time, but before we wrap up, just really quickly, because this is how we will work in 2020, which is three years away. I want to know, just for you, Adrian, to give us the final point, what skill are you developing to be ready for three years from now? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, I am continuing to focus on being agile um, to the point that you never a master, and I have changed multiple times in my career, so my background is all over the place. And, and you know what? I've really enjoyed that. Um, and as I get older, you kind of go, oh, I, I kind of feel comfortable here. And I'm really training myself, as soon as I start feeling comfortable, to start making sure, sit up, look around, you need to start feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and I think that is a really key thing that I see, this agility and flexibility, along with, I think, Con's right about problem solving, uh, are going to be really, really important. And the other thing that I think we talked, I know I talked a bit about creative thinking, and I certainly don't put myself in the creative bucket, and I think most people don't. But the more I've read and the more I've understood creative thinking, the more I've really understood that's what we all do. It actually, we're born with the ability to think creatively, to approach problems in a way that machines, no matter how good they get, certainly by 2020, won't be able to solve for us. And so I think we all need to understand creatives doesn't just mean you're highly musical or you're a fabulous painter or, or a writer. It actually is just something innate in all of us. Um, so keep, th keep thinking that. Thank you. Thank you.